Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. But when I talk about deep seated kind of feelings about this song, it just takes me back to when I was five years old with my dad in Connecticut marching on the state capitol. And how every time the students would get together for a uh, session of some kind, they always used to sing this song. It was always, we shall overcome and lift every voice and sing. And so, you know, I'm going to be 59 years old. So this song has been part of my life for as long as I can remember. And so before we begin getting into talking about the actual rendition and how that came together and stuff like that, let's just talk about this 115 year old song. Alvin and Jarrett, you can talk amongst yourselves. Actually, that's not really right. Jarrett, um, you're young, you're, you're the youngest one of this bunch. So I wanna know how you feel about it. How, how, did, how did you kind of like get with Lift Every Voice and Sing? <laughs> this song has been a part of my life since I can remember. Uh, every Black History Month, my church, for the four Sundays or however many Sundays were, avail were, were available to us in February, we would have our congregational hymn and we would sing, lift every voice and sing. We'd sing all the verses. And so it was something that was very ingrained um, from a very early age and the opportunity to, uh, to kind of just, you know, bring it back to the forefront and obviously partnering with Alvin to, to kind of just carry this mantle of this incredible anthem that so many people don't even know about. Um, I've actually had an opportunity to speak with a number of people who are my peers, who are former educators, who were entirely unaware that the song was even in existence. And of course, the, the importance that it plays in, you know, in, in our community. And so the opportunity to be, you know, to, to have this teachable moment with so many different people and to have the conversation continue uh, with, with regards to its importance within the movement towards uh, equity and equality for all and for us to have just you know representation and the like to be actually able to advance that forward and also to make sure that 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 advancement is not um you know upon with the impetus of someone else's you know having to lose another life it was not brought brought upon at least obviously it was spurred by so much happening around us but now this opportunity is coming about um not by virtue of someone else uh losing a life or another victim uh, to have to speak about, but rather to, it's more of a celebration. And to be a part of this kind of celebration right now has been so humbling and I'm, I'm truly honored to do it. And of course, to be able to partner with um, the most, one of the, I'm, I'm sorry, the most iconic bass I know, um, Alvin Chia uh, of, you know, the, the incredible Take Six, that just makes, you know, makes it that much better. That, that's the icing on the cake for me. Well, I got to tell you, um, you definitely speak about it with a certain amount of reverence, um, meaning the song, about a certain amount of reverence. Um, um, and like I said, you're the youngest one here, but uh, I went to visit my brother um, in February, a couple of years ago. He lives in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and he stays near and attends service. I think he's a deacon at the Alfred Street Baptist Church, which is like the oldest, like black church in Virginia or something like that. And it was Black History Month and they sang Lift Your Every Voice and Sing and they sang all the verses and I thought that was great. But I mean, and this is just a, a, an observation and we kind of wrote about it a little bit that there was a time where this song was sung several times a week instead of just several times in one particular month. And I'm wondering, you know, um, just how, you know, and just to be clear, you know, your motivation, how it just came top of mind. It was something that you, you wanted to celebrate in that way, in this way. Well, as creatives, as artists, I felt like it was it was incumbent upon us to use our voices, to use our literal voices and say, okay, 
this is not going to be everything happening around us is going to be happening for sadly for for a, a long time to come i want to make my voice be heard in a way that hopefully will be remembered right. and uh I would, the, the song kind of just popped in my head one day and it was in my spirit just to kind of do it, but I was kind of like, ah, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. And then just, there was confirmation that came from a, a very dear friend of mine, um, legendary uh, Christian artist, uh, Sandy Patty reached out to me and, and out of nowhere and says, I need to hear your voice singing, lift every voice and sing. And I'd already been thinking about it and I guess that was just kind of the confirmation in my spirit that I needed to hear. And so it was, and she expected me just, just to kind of, you know, do a video recording of me just singing with every voice and saying, and that was it. I, I felt it, I felt it was very necessary. If I'm going to do this, I want to do it with excellence. I want it to be something that will hopefully just, you know, resume the conversation uh, or at least I'm sorry, continue the conversation that already been started with regards to black lives matters and, and, and just a general civil rights movement. I feel like if we're going to do it, let's just do it with excellence. And I thought I had essentially a completed project until um, I spoke with uh, Take Six Soundman, uh, Tony Huerta, who was like, Jared, it's a nice, it's a, it's a nice arrangement, but you need Alvin. You need to call Alvin. <laughs> Enter Alvin. <laughs> listen, I'm, I, I know my role. I stay in my lane. I am not a bass. So I, and I called him and, and it just, it just, it was something that just felt like it was special for some reason that I couldn't even articulate, but it was definitely a special thing coming together in a way that was bigger than me, bigger than, than Alvin. And the opportunity to, again, just steward this moment. Well, that's what it turned into for us. Gotcha. Alvin, so when he calls you, what do you say? I'm busy, man. <laughs> Quit bothering me. <laughs> no, um, you can actually, say that because that's the kind of relationship you have. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> he, Jared had called early, early, early when it, the Nuggets were first going around, and he was like, "Bro, you got to do something with this." We had worked on some stuff together before, and had never been released. But he was like, "Man, you got to do something with this." I was like, Jared, man, I got so much. This was in the the right at the pinnacle of all the virtual choirs and everyone had a project and you had to be right on your computer and you and you so I was pinned to my computer day and night and I was like man I'll tell you what you get started on something and you know just let me know and what he sent back was like oh wow he made some big decisions that first of all everyone who sung that know there's about 17,000 verses he picked um, you know, the, 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 the best of, and went with that. And some, some of the, the choices he made harmonically when it breathes and when it soars and when it, when there's tension, when there's release, um, so that I hadn't heard him working on it. So I was, I had fresh ears when I got it because I went to HBCU, I approached it as a spiritual, you yes. know, like a, one of those classic, Fist Jubilee Choir kind of yeah. things, or for my school, it was the Oakwood Aeolians, and um, and and just kind of jumped on it. What the what what would the basses do? What would the what right. would the lines be? How would it interplay? And um, and I think what his contemporary sound on top and my more traditional approach on the bottom, I think it made a, a really nice moment. But um, but yeah, J Jarrett's got um, he, he's got a lot of a lot of positivity and. He speaks, his music comes from a plate deep in, deep in his heart. And so if I was to weigh in, I knew I was going to have, it was going to have to be a special moment. Well, special it was. Uh, you know, so a slight pivot here, actually it's not a slight pivot. This is, um, we have definitely a, uh, we're in an era of um, unprecedented, well, it's not unprecedented. I'm about to say unprecedented racial tension. Um, it's, but it's not unprecedented. But I think that um, the last four years preceded by the prior eight years gives us a very interesting perspective and in, on race relations in America. Um, we, um, we spoke with an artist last night, Fantastic Negrito, who shared with us that he had grown up in Massachusetts. And then when he moved from Massachusetts to Oakland, it was like a culture shock. 
but he had friends of all races and colors and creeds and stuff like that. And um, and then afterwards, Jason and I had a wonderful conversation. We kind of shared our personal experiences because in my younger years, I was in Connecticut. And then I grew moved to New York and all the brothers were like, well, what kind of alien are you? And, and Jason shared that his best friend was this guy, uh, uh, Buster, what was his yeah. name? Buster, right? Well, that, that was he had two two names. He had actually um, that name, which was the family name, and then he always ran around with with the the name that he gave the the family African name, I, I guess it was, and then um, William, which was his his name that I knew him by. But I would go by Abeo, Buster, or William. It, whatever <laughs> he was going through that day is what I ever did. So <laughs> the struggle. Yeah, and so what Thornell's talking about is, for me, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I was really fortunate to grow up in a very multicultural family, and also multicultural school. Um, you know, in the eighth grade, I had a, a teacher named Yvette Fowler, Miss Fowler, who on the chalkboard um, wrote the song What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. And what I find really interesting at all about this is she wrote out the lyrics and she made us stand there and recite the lyrics as if it was literature. And yeah. that's something I, I think that, you know, in a, in a school that I was in and, and growing up, you know, and like our vice president, I was bust also, you know, I guess. Um, but all these, all these songs, you know, from Lift Every Voice to uh, Strange Fruit to Mahalia Jackson doing Take My My Hand, Precious Lord, you know, all started from the written poem. And it wasn't until I got to actually see what what's going on and recite it out, not as a, as a song, but as a written word and, and go through every line. And she would explain that this is about, you know, uh, night, you know, the, the 70s in Vietnam, Blacks in, in Vietnam, and, and then they come home and they're treated worse than anybody else here, you know, and that was the beginning of the civil rights movement with music, really, right. you know, to, to where things have changed. And one thing that, that I shouldn't say disappoints me, but, but also that, that I know that Thornell and I have as educators is outside of the hashtags um, that everybody puts on their socials, no one reads, right? And how do we get to a point in, in our schools today uh, to put put what's going on on the chalkboard and, and get these kids engaged? Yeah. You guys grew up with, you know, lift every voice. I didn't, you know, that's a problem. Even though we didn't have Black History Month only on February, we had it throughout the years. There's no excuse that we don't know this, right. you know? Right. I live in Los Angeles. I know what La Cucaracha was. I knew what La Bamba was. Right. So where's the disconnect that you have with Black culture sure. in society today? You guys aren't, are, you know, from LA. So there was, you know, Thornell as well, we were talking about. So there was always an upkeep. And one of the other conversations I had with Thornell was being arrested at 15 with William. Mm. So I got to experience it. A little mm. taste of that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it was just, a, it was a bank just, robbery, but all in all, yeah. You know, yeah but I'm no. saying it's not just yeah. uh, uh, um, uh, white men and women who are unfamiliar with this song. You right. know, you take the demographic. I would say probably 30 and younger now. They probably have never heard of it, um, and uh, would be would be shocked at some of the lot of the. There's, there's a movie on right now, Ma Rainey. The people don't know that story. Um, uh, uh, the the mm. the lady who did um, the hair products that came on the beginning of the year. See, uh, see. Oh, uh, Walker. Walker. Mm -hmm. Walker. That was on. There are a lot of people that don't know that story. So, you know, I I get that. You know, the, the some of the some of the stories are are hard and they're dark and they're and and they're they don't have a lot of soaring hope in them. But it comes from a place. It's a touchstone for us to look forward. And I, I think it's important to always remember, always remember. Right. Well, and that, and that as well, too. And, and it's funny as well, because Abel, Abel Miracle, who wrote Strange Fruit, had written a song. And Sam Cooke, um, well, Blowing the Wind, Bob Dylan. Yeah. 
you know, about civil rights. And Sam Cooke's like, wait, why is this guy doing it? A white Jew, just like Abel right. doing Strange Fruit. Why? Sure. I mean, we're all in the same ballpark, you know, as, as a member of the tribe. Um, but Jewish tribe, that's what we call yep. it. No, I got you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Sam Cooke comes out, I got to make an anthem for, for us too and not have somebody else make it for us. So I'm going to create, uh, you know, the, his infamous song. So Right, right. Yeah, I, I was really blessed growing up in San Francisco that um, my parents, my dad was from Liberia, West Africa. My mom was from Guyana, South America. Neither one of them was Americans. But for whatever right. reason, when they came to town in the 60s, they got it. They understood that something was happening that was very unique and different. And my mom, I just posted a picture the other. My mom had her big Afro blowout. My dad hit his big African Afro blowout. And, and the, they, they and the head of our with the right, <laughs> and they took us to the African uh, African Cultural Center. African, I think it was called Afro Cultural Center. Um, there, by, right, uh, right, right um, by Freedom West and all those places, right down there. And I remember being there probably two or three times a week uh, and, and just learning. And we would, you know, we would sing the uh, national anthem and we would sing um, Joan Baez and If I Had a Hammer and all those kind yeah. of folk songs. There was a lot of stuff happening right. in the Bay Area and San Francisco by those times. But it made me keenly aware that, um, uh, that there, we were all connected. We were all connected. We, we would have different dialects and different ways of approaching it. But there's a, a, there a common struggle that we were gonna deal with even not then at some point in our lives. Right. As somebody in the in the thing in the in the panel was saying, or in, in the attendees, uh, "We shall overcome" was actually taught in school. And I, I do remember that. Yeah, huge, huge, huge. Yeah, I remember that all the time. We sang that all the time. It, you know, I, it, I, there's something energetically happening now. I know. I don't know if you believe in astrology or anything like that, but the there does the Jupiter Saturn conjunction happened yesterday, and it's yeah. supposed to be. It, my cousin described it as the literal dawning of the age of Aquarius mm -hmm. and um, that conjunction hasn't happened for 800 years mm -hmm. and astronomers say that if you go back in time it actually corresponds with the star of Bethlehem in the birth of Jesus right mm -hmm. but the thing that I was want to talk about um, was really something happened in the news last week where and you brought up John, Bob Dylan so he's been top of mind for me um, he sold his entire catalog, including the writer's share, right, to Universal. And the one song I know by Bob Dylan was Blown in Wind, right? And I'm just wondering if there is a shift happening where music that, you know, I, you know, that not, I mean, it's not from the movement or because it's going to be a new movement, right? Right. Um, the old songs will always have their place and then new songs will come, you know, and, you know, but, you know, we, the way we write songs and things is different. I just, you know, I'm, one, I'm waiting to hear what that sounds like, <laughs> you know? Mm. Um, and so I would say in terms of music for this time, what would you say that is, or has it been invented yet? And that's for either you or Jared. I know that John Legend and, and, and the rapper Common have been a huge focal point as far as some of the artists being the, the you know, some of the louder voices when it comes to, um, especially the, the ones that are more mainstream, but the, a number of, uh, of, I guess they call themselves, they don't, I don't guess, they call themselves conscious rappers. Uh, a lot of those guys and, and ladies, of course, will, um, are, have been instrumental in keeping the discussion going as well. Yes. Uh, I, I would say that that is absolutely part of that sound of continuing with the movement. Uh, I can't honestly say I can think of a lot of like soul artists or, um, or I guess even folk, even like you know folk type artists that are happening right now that are really writing music towards uh, that type of uh, effort of, of equality and, and social justice right now. I mean, like I said, John Legend and Common are probably the ones that come to mind first. Me. Well, you know, the thing that shocked me, because, you know, my my cynical self, it's like, you know, I can listen to some of the music now, and I love hip hop and rap music, so I, I, I can't say that it's just, this is necessarily a disparaging comment, but I do sometimes think, well, what are they going to sing 30 years from now, you know? 
But I was really happy to hear like during the protests that people were singing or chanting or rapping, whatever, Kendrick Lamar, we're gonna be all right. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, they yeah. found the thread that made sense, you know, that resonated with them. And that was yeah. so important and so beautiful and stuff. Uh, just question, I mean, so we're gonna show the video in a little while. Mm -hmm. And and um, it takes me to the protest. And in the video, there are some stills in, in a, a, from a very turbulent time in this year, right? And um, did you happen to get out and protest? And were you in the streets? I went out once. Uh, my wife and I went out once. And we, we felt compelled to go out just because just again, it's just any opportunity to try to just stand yeah. in, stand, you know, alongside those who are trying to, you know, enact change. And for the people who don't believe that change does, does not happen, does not occur from protests, I'm sorry. I mean, so much, so much actual uh, legislation has been put, put forth because of protests. I mean, so much, so many discussions and conversations have taken place because of protests. A lot of times people don't even know that there's an issue until protests, you know, comes to the front of someone's mind. So right. we went out once, but after a while, it just got to be to a point where it felt like there were a number of people who were there to cause harm. And so I didn't feel safe taking my wife out there, especially um, beyond the one that we went to, because after a while, it felt like there were a number of people who were agitators trying to potentially, you know, cause harm to the, to the, the, the peaceful protesters that were out there. So that was my, I mean, I don't know, we, we came to an agreement, my wife and I just, it's like, it's, I mean, there are other ways to obviously enact change, yeah. but that of course has always been a tool of change for certain. Well, everyone has their role that they can play. And that's the one thing that, you know, that makes whatever you do okay. Um, it's, it's, it's about the consciousness, right? So, I mean, Alvin, you don't live in the city, but did you get out in the streets at no, all? I, I could have easily been in the middle of it. Um, it. There was a very decided, decisive split that I went through. I have three young black sons. Yes. Um, 29, no, relatively young, 20, <laughs> uh, actually at the, yeah, 28, no, no, sorry, 29, 22 and 10. And um, <laughs> I looked at him and was like, me being a black father at this point, will I teach them more by having them in the streets protesting or is my role as to make sure these kids make it alive through this process? Is that my overall overarching responsibility here? Um, I was, and I, I could have gone either way with it, with an argument either way. Um, but I decided to keep them safe. I have a son that is six foot seven. And, um, and just when he walks in the room, he's that, that guy. And um, I have another son who's, you know, six foot two with big Afro and all of that. And, um, and then my little guy. Um, so I, I decided to, um, to, to <laughs> what we ended up doing was staying home and listening to um, recordings of, of slave, um, former slaves and it was fascinating this guy went through and he had all of these old recordings of these people who had been in slavery and they were afraid and they were telling their stories um so that's what we did a couple of nights as a family wow that that's extraordinary and that was proactive and that planted a seed and you, you did your part right right so right that, right that, I was torn. I didn't. I didn't know how treat how history was going to treat it or treat yeah. me. And right. I said, "What is your role here? Right. You know, right? Uh, what's your responsibility?" And I decided for them to be able to be able to teach their sons. And to do that, they got to be here. Well, here's a pivot, Jason. I'm. I'm. I'm I, I love the fact that we had that conversation last night because I got, really have some insight. Um, so. You talk about being a black father with three black sons, and so Jason kind of mentioned, you know, that he got taken to jail with some of his friends. Um, and you, I, I, what I want you to do, Jay, is walk us through not necessarily what happened, 
but the responses from the parents. All right. Um, I, I just want anecdotal, just really want to mention something that we were, we were talking about, about. I have a, a friend uh, when I was about 25 years old, and then we'll get the story. And it, it's in kind of relation to having your kids stay home. Um, my friend, uh, his name is Keith. He's now in law enforcement. And believe it or not, he's actually a Trumpian. He's black. So that always, I, I never quite figured that out about him. But when he was 25 years old, he called me on the phone and he didn't say anything. And he said, not hello or anything. He just said, man, I turned 25 year old today. And I thought I was going to either be dead or in jail. And I made it. I made it. And that's all I said. Wow. And that just impacted me so much for my whole life. Yeah. And not understanding until, because we knew each other because I used to be a, a medic and work for the fire department and all that prior to being in radio and music. Um, and so I was on the streets a lot for my early, from 18 on and on. So that was something that all, you know, that I always resonated with. And, and I totally understand and appreciate what you did. And I think that's amazing what you did with your kids. Because in order really to, to go out and protest, you have to know what you're protesting. Right, right, you know? right, right. So what he was saying is, Ms. Thornell was saying is, um, I don't know more reaction, but um, when we were arrested, you know, I was put into a cell, handcuffed to, to the side. My friend William Buster was handcuffed to the, the railing on the stairwell. And we had Jatem, who is this Indian kid from England. So obviously we got two brown skinned kids handcuffed and he was handcuffed to a chair and his parents reaction, I guess, was a little more of just very disappointed, you know, culturally. William's mom, who, who has kind of been my surrogate mother even today, um, you know, was, was doing the whoop ass type thing on him. And then my dad was just laughing, you know. So I, I don't know, Thornell, what you wanted me to say about this. That, but. No, but that's exactly what I what I wanted. It was um, the milieu that you come from will will um, um, color your response to things, right? Yeah. So you know, if one of his sons had gone out and protested and gotten arrested or harmed or anything like that, his response would have been completely different. Yeah. That your Indian friend who was here as a, uh, a student from England, and here you are, an American from California, <laughs> a white guy from California who had this wonderful group of friends. I, I know you guys had a, a ball. Um, but just the, re the parental responses is actually exactly what, what I wanted to illustrate. Yeah, I mean, with uh, my dad, he was, a, you know, he was in the army, so it, the laugh was more of, you're a dumbass, uh, you got what you got, I'm not telling your mom, that's it. Right. You know? Right. And I don't even thought, know if my mom ever knew, to be honest. Well, she knows now. Well, she's <laughs> baby. Yeah. Right. Oh, my, 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 my. So um, I thought that this would be a great um, point of conversation. Um, but, you know, Obviously, this all came about because Alvin and Jarrett, you know, delivered such a beautiful um, arrangement and rendition of this song. But even before it got the Grammy nomination, the NAACP recognized it. So yeah. that was what I didn't even know that when I, so tell us about the contest and all that. I don't even know if Alvin knew about the contest when I submitted it. Uh, you do all four. I do, a, I, do, I do a lot of things, and I'll be like, hey, Alvin, by the way, this just happened. He'll be like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> uh, a, a very good friend of mine who actually lives in Florida, she says, Jared, you need to submit your version of Lift Every Voice and Sing to this competition because it's such a great version of it. I'm like, okay, I didn't even know about the competition or the, you know, the contest you know, taking place. So I submitted my, I submitted our rendition and, and I didn't even know if we 
gotten even uh, accepted if, if the submission was accepted or not. Come to find out, you know, fast forward a few weeks later, Jared, they just played your 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 uh, version of the third voice and sing on the virtual march. I'm like, what? So I had to find out. They didn't even call me. NAACP didn't even contact me at all. I had to find out from a friend who was watching the virtual march that we were featured. And I, so I had to run it back. I'm like, wait a minute, what? And so the idea that um, April Ryan, I mean, I have such an ex extreme appreciation for, and I hope one day I get a chance to meet her for the amazing work that she does, obviously, as a member of the, the White House uh, press staff and, and now, you know, her new, her new position at the Grill. Uh, the, just just to hear her say, uh, you know, our names and, 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 you know, and announce that we were the winners. It was such a very, again, humbling experience. This whole thing has been just one, one after another opportunity just to say, wow, thank you, God. It's like a wow, wow moment because the idea of being on this stage, again, bringing this song back to um, an audience that, either, or back or to an audience that maybe have never even known the song. Again, being able to be a part of that story, that's the part that's just mind blowing to me always. And Jerry, you should actually meet her. I would love to meet her. I, it, it's I so much, one day it happens. It's so much easier these days to just reach out and, and kind of tag and all that and she'll she'll know, you know? I hope so. I mean, I, I again, I mean, you never know what's going to happen. But the fact that, you know, again, she's such a uh, an esteemed uh, journalist who's who's dealt with a lot of stuff over her <laughs> over her time in the White yeah. House, especially the last four years. Uh, it's just a, it's just, again, extremely honored to hear her say, say that, you know, say, say my name. So, yeah. So That's I do have a question for you guys. And it, it, it's, it, it, it may seem odd to some, but it makes sense to me. Did we need Donald Trump? Mm. I think Alvin, so. I'll, I'll let you go first, Alvin. I'll let you go first. <laughs> I personally think so. I think so. I think so. Uh, Dave Chappelle had a brilliant uh, um, sketch that he did talking about Medgar Evers and the horror that came from, no, I'm sorry, not um, um, the, the young boy who was killed. May, Emmett Till? Um, Emmett Till. Emmett Till, yeah. Emmett Till, the horror that came from his murder. Right. The good that came from it. You couldn't see it when you were in the front of it. But it sparked the civil rights movement, and it sparked this, and it sparked that, and it sparked back such a, a detestable, horrid event that cooked off so much good because of the backlash from it. I re really believe that there is going to be a um, a projection forward from a moral sense for us as Americans that we know we can never come back here. I, it's not even about. Um, Democrat, Republican. It is just a lack of respect for humanity and and respect for each other. We have sunk so low, and our 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 profile and credibility in the world stage has sunk so low that we know this is the touch point. It's got to this got to shoot us forward. I believe this evil was necessary. Yeah, and as and as both of us, myself, you know, Alvin and I both, we travel the world, you know, and see audiences of all creeds, all nationalities, ethnicities, and they all look at us and say, and, and they give us the impression of just being sad for us and embarrassed for us. I absolutely believe that, though, that there is a, a lot of good that came from him being in office and that I, he activated me. I never had so much passion and so much desire to learn about what's happening beyond the general election what's happening beyond, um, you know, just, you know, the midterms, no, knowing that there's so much more work to be done in the middle of all that, you know, whether it be, you know, your local, your local governments, uh, you know, opportunities to be a part of legislation being moved forward and, and, and all that kind of stuff that I never had any type of interest in until I realized how much, how important it was because I was, I became, I think, I think, it, without obviously never to disrespect, you know, what uh, President Obama did, but that was like a win. We celebrated the win. And mm. in, in celebration comes placation. And so we <laughs> found ourselves in a space of just, oh man, we finally did it. We got here. I know I never thought I was going to see a, a Black president in my lifetime. Never thought that. Nor a Black, you know, uh, 
female vice president of color in my lifetime, never. So the idea that he came in and he was a savior for a lot of people. He was perfect. He was the perfect president. No, he wasn't. But he, he lulled us into complacency to a point where it allowed for other evils, other ideals, I should say, then how about that, ideals to grow and simmer to the point where now we have to do a lot of work to reverse the curse, if you will. Reverse the curse, I love it. And you know, I completely agree with you on this whole eight years of complacency kind of thing, but it really was eight years worth of complacency. And I know Alvin can relate to this. When we were kids, they used to teach us civics. There was a civics class where we learned about the government, the three branches, how Bill moves through. They had mock Congress, all kinds of stuff, so that we knew how our government worked. And somewhere along the way, and I don't know when it is, maybe Jason, you have an idea. I don't know whether it was the school funding or what, but they stopped no. civics in school. And now nobody knows. You know who knows? And which is the irony of it all? The immigrants. The immigrants they have to know. They yeah. have to know. In order to become a citizen, they have to learn it. I am glad you mentioned that. So okay, so that what I told you, my parents were uh, Liberian West African, my mom is Guyanese. One bone that they always had to pick, and I had to defend American African Americans, mm -hmm. is that they looked at African Americans as having this gift of being born in this amazing country with so many freedoms and so so much at your disposal and, and not doing anything with it necessarily, um, that they tended to look at um, uh, people born here, white and black, as lazy, yeah. you know? Because to make to even make it to these shores, you have to be the best of the best. And it was all about education. It was all about being extra prepared, being early to appointments, being extra qualified for whatever job or whatever appointment. And so, you know, it plays right into what you were saying. There are a lot of things that are taken granted for granted in this country. Being we just always figured that eight years was gonna last forever, that it was always gonna be great. And when it's flipped around, it was like whoa oh wait hmm it does it's not about who you know it there is there is a a, a a a modicum of what you know as well you know. Mm -hmm. yeah except in our business right <laughs> <laughs> right nobody knows what okay. about this business. <laughs> that's crazy so i mean um i'm going to take this moment to um play the video and um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more. And if there's any questions, anybody who's listening, say Johnny Burt's out there, Stacey Turner, um, who I am so thankful for actually bringing me on the team at MI five years ago. She's on there. If anybody has any questions, but that puts in the chat room, Jason will get to asking them. But right now, uh, we're going to watch and uh, enjoy Lift Every Voice and Sing the video. Okay, well, we're, we should be able to do it. It's like, it's like watching your, uh, your mom uh, program the VCR. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just mean. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing Sing a song full of the faith that the 
Big shout out to Oronde Jenkins who helped to curate this video and make it what it was. Big shout out to him. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Pharrell, you got to turn it off again. I know. (laughs) What I was looking for a good edit point. (laughs) (laughs) But the reason why I I wanted to kind of do this now and was how did it feel when you found out that you were nominated? Oh, it was it was amazing. First of all, let me brag on Jared. I'm kind of the touchy feely guy in this partnership. Jared is very intentional. We're gonna do this. We're gonna fill out this document. We're gonna go for this. This is what I want to achieve. This is the goal we're going for. This is the thing. And I'm just like, yeah, man, cool. Yeah, man, cool. So to see <laughs> actual thing happen that he called four months ago, five months ago, um, he said, yeah, man, we're gonna get an, uh, we're gonna get this Grammy nomination. You're gonna get your 11th. And I'm gonna get my first, or you know, and I was like, okay, Jared, okay, Jared, okay, Jared, okay. <laughs> and then to see it happen, it's like, wow. So we called each other up screaming. It was, it was just incredible with our wives screaming in the background. It was just one of those moments. And meanwhile, I've already won 10. Yeah, that, that, that's what <laughs> it sounds like. Whole Jared, thing. You're just, yeah, you're, he's like, whatever, I don't need any more. I don't even have places for him anymore. And you're just like, this is a one. <laughs> He'll make room for this one. He'll find way, he'll find a way to make room for this one. <laughs> Just total different energy. You're so happy to do it with him. I thought that, uh, and you, you shared with me a story about how this particular nomination is different for you because it's your name. Right. Yeah. Um, I, if anybody who's been in a band, you know you're the bass. You're the lead. You're Nobody ever knows your name, especially a gospel group. They don't know who you are. Um, the best I get sometimes is you look familiar. That's that's <laughs> what I'm like, okay. Um, but to see, so I've got 10 Grammys here at the house with take six, take six, take six, take six. Everything in this house is take six. I even have a candle behind me with six guys, and you know, everything's six, 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 six. So to be able to get this thing, uh, um, Jared Johnson, Alvin Shea, it's like they even spell my name right. It was amazing, <laughs> well, they amazing, did. really gratifying moment. So, yeah, it's beautiful. That's so awesome. It that was. Is- I was. I shed pure tears. I mean, it was, and, and and maybe part of it was just from the fact that it's an exhausting process to get to that point. Um, again, yeah, <laughs> uh, with the amount of just you know trying to hey you know the four year consideration process. It's just a very. Uh, so a lot of energy needs to go into that to make any type of headway, especially as a fully independent. Alvin and I are in a group and we don't have a label behind us. We don't have anything but just a lot of support from the community, the vocal community at large, the, you know, obviously people within the um, civil rights and, and just people who want to support us from that, that perspective. It, again, this is a very unique time in, in history and in music and, and in the arts. And the fact that we're here in this moment um, amidst four other composers of instrumental pieces, it just, I believe it's just very telling of, of just how important this song still is and, and just how much it resonates. But for me personally, I was, uh, 
I was pure tears and it probably came over. I mean, it, I just came over me to like, wow. It, it was a, almost like a relief that I can't believe we got to this point when right. I now fully understand what, it's, what it means when people say it's an honor to be nominated. Right. I never understood just how salient a, a statement that was until the moment it happened. And again, to do it with my brother, Alvin, it, 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 it means that much more to be able to do it with him. Also, people may not realize, but Jared and I are good friends, but we're also prayer partners. Yes. Oh, yes. We, we, we pray every morning, at when, every Wednesday morning for the last six years. Uh, so we know each other's lives inside and out and have prayed each other up through every kind of possible thing. We also work together with a blind camp. So yeah. we, we have we have sown into each other's lives and encouraged and, and rallied behind each other and different things and done things uh, for when nobody cared, nobody was watching, no one's checking for us and now at the highest level. So it is really, really an amazing, amazing experience to, um, to be faithful with such, with little and be trusted with so much. Yeah. I gotta tell you, I'm, I, that is a, a story that I hadn't heard before. And that's really and truly awesome. It inspires me. Um, the, I mentioned Stacey Turner before. I'm not sure if you had an opportunity to ever meet her, but you all, all three of you have a Quincy connection. She was like uh, an r admin for um, Quincy's label at, um, why am I having a brain fart? Quest. Quest, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Quest, yeah. For many years. And obviously, Jared um, wrote on um, Soul Bossa Nostra and at some in the albums. And Alvin, obviously, you have your Q connection too. And, um, and I guess in a kind of way I do too, by extension, <laughs> through Naturally Seven and Soul Bossa Nostra. Yes, yes, um, you do. Yeah. So, I mean, um, but we won't necessarily go down that path because we're celebrating you guys today. And I gotta say, um, oh, excuse me, I've been, I've been, I've been told that actually Stacy was director of A and R, not A and R admin, but A and R. So, so the ears right. are, are are also legendary. Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> but even, but l let's put a little spin on that. She was a woman in that role as head of a &R at Quincy's label. So I applaud her for being in that role and, and, doing, and doing so well. Um, that kind of brings us to the end of our time. Um, I don't know if, uh, Jason, you have any additional questions or Jared, you have something you wanna to say to bring us home, but this has just been so wonderful. I just wanna thank you personally for, you know, holding up the light and you know, being the vessel for this song in this time, um, I was really sitting here watching the video, hold, oh, holding back tears. Mm -hmm. But I, there, there's one thing that we can either be upset about or we can laugh about. And you and I had the same experience. So you know, my intention was as soon as I got the the files and we were going to start, you know, sharing with people outside of this bubble that we talked about. And I loaded it up to Facebook and I put it on Boost. And about five hours later, I got a notification, rejected because of the quote unquote content of the video. Hmm. It was political. It was too powerful. Wow. It was too um, emotional. And so the powers that be tried to squash it. Hmm. We're not gonna allow or let that to happen because this wow. is our history. Right. Yes, sir. Our song. Yes, right. sir. Right. And Lift Every Voice sings again. Right. Yes, indeed. A to the men. A to the men. You guys have plans to do something together again? Talk about the Christmas song. How about that? <laughs> Alvin, this You is should you. mention it. Uh, uh, this time, I took the lead on it. Um, and, yes, you did, uh, boy. And brought, brought in Jared. And uh, we did uh, Carol of the Bells. And then uh, Jared had the great idea to bring in Butterscotch uh, to do the, some beatboxing on it. And it came out really, really right, great. And again, the, the amazing Arende did the, um, uh, the video on it. It's, and that's just been released a couple of days ago. So if you, uh, if you um, 
look at the right source of be care a little bit is that is it up on um is it on youtube jared or is it on just it's on youtube uh, it's, it's on all the so instagram youtube facebook the whole whole thing yeah but on alvin shea jared johnson carol of the bells that's right and, and let me tell you just to gas you up i you know when you first told me about it i was just like okay christmas song carol of the bells all right but that arrangement is sickening <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> wow all the whoo yeah, <laughs> really, really extraordinary. Very, I, I, very this cool. is where I get to brag on Alvin briefly. Uh, so he 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 didn't say the part where I said Alvin, we need to do. I got we got hired actually. Here's a real quick story. An artist hired us to do an arrangement of it that he was gonna then sing the lead over. And so I'm like Alvin, this, we're we weren't busy for whatever reason at the time. I'm like this would be a nice little opportunity to make a little side money or whatever. Let's go ahead and put something together. He's like I've never done this before. I go, dude, I've heard you play piano. You've done this before and you can do this now. And so it was a literal, it was the first time I told Alvin, I'm like, dude, you can do this. And he was like, well, if Jared says I can do it, I think I can do it. <laughs> I and went to the piano and literally says, apparently Jared thinks I can do this. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and, and, and ladies and gentlemen, whoever's watching this right now, let me tell you, okay. I mean, the apple does not fall fall far from the take six tree there is so much genius in in the midst of that entire group and alvin is absolutely um he has his own sound and an incredible way of creating that i'm honored to have had played even the tiniest role in that one so he he came through with an amazing i mean i mean i think i threw a couple couple you know cents in that sucker but that was really alvin's alvin's baby and he really just took it home thank you brother mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. yes that was absolutely, absolutely a delightful and surprise and a treat. Um, it, it takes you through it. It has movements. <laughs> <laughs> it's That's almost cute. seven minutes and has movements, and it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, clearly, Lift Every Voice was not a fluke. <laughs> this <laughs> is <laughs> this is something else. I I really look forward to hearing more and more and more. So with that, I've been told. Alvin, Alvin really about. quick, what's it like having such a massive deep voice? By the way. <laughs> My kids don't Even take me seriously. Laugh, everybody yeah. thinks I intimidate everybody. They're just like, yeah, it's just dead. That's it. I yeah, I say there's a whole bunch of stuff I can't do, but I can sing low. Okay. You can sing low, or or pretend you're singing. This is CNN. Right. Oh, no, I've, <laughs> I've rehearsed for years. Yeah. As soon as James Earl gets sick, I'm all over it. You're on it, right? No. I don't. You know, I don't think they'll ever get rid of that. No, it's. I wouldn't. It's. 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 Uh. It's amazing. Um, and by the way, quiz microsecond. I talked to James Earl Jones at an event. I'll say, "Do you ever audition for anything?" And he said, "Of course I do. Not everything is right for me." And I was like, <laughs> "Oh, you auditioned them? I get it. Ah. Yeah, he's on a whole nother level." <laughs> it's like, uh, what's his name? Morgan Freeman. Right. You right. know what There's you get? Cats that just they just yeah. got it. That's it. The, li the literal voice of God. <laughs> you walk right. in and you got the job. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just Orson Welles used to do that. Orson Welles used to go into a place and and then he would say, um, he would say, okay, I'm done. Yeah. After like yeah. one or two one tapes. Tape. Yeah. Roll yeah. tape because it's going to come out right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Allison Perkins Thomas tells us we have a hard stop at 755 and here we are. So this has been fantastic. Thank you for Thank you, indulging. Thank you for the conversation, and you know, there's more to come. This is just has been wonderful. Well, I, I just can't say it enough. Thank you, Alvin. Hey, Jared, let's get you involved with April, please. <laughs> April, I ain't promising nothing, but you know, April, social, watching, social. I'm yeah. a huge fan. I'm following you on all the socials. You're phenomenal. I would dig it big time. It'd be great. Do you not follow her? Or? No, I do follow her. Absolutely. Oh, you do. Absolutely. Self promotion. You should you should tell her, hey, I just want to let you know that you know, nominated for a Grammy. I mean, maybe I'll send it. I don't know. Is that how it works? Could I just say oh I want to be the next this is CNN guy? I gotta speak it into existence. Alvin, I gotta tell you, it, it's it's weird. Um, Jim Acosta follows me on on Twitter. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> nice little. Wait, you you dropped this. You dropped this yeah. this little. There you go. There you go. It's okay. No, 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 I mean, it has nothing to I, do I with it. it but it's like the weirdest people follow you yeah i, like I would that. i would love to speak with her though it'd be great yeah, yeah. well 2021 bigger and better things for all of us 
for all of us. Okay. All right, guys. Bonsoir. Thanks so much. Pleasure to meet you all. Thank you all. Take care.